remind everyone that the session is being recorded. Hi, Sugendra. Uh, the session is being recorded and that uh, um, uh, be careful on uh, uh, on on making uh, um, comments which are totally unfounded or, or uh, you know, but generally, uh, you know, normal clinical conversation is fine. Um, as I mentioned, the university look upon uh, the attendance of these study group uh, meetings as very positive and certainly does help me when we come to the exam board and I'm asked uh, what's the participation of the student been like. So uh, at the end of the session, uh, I would like you to leave uh, a feedback on the session, just basically whether you enjoyed it, whether you found it useful. Uh, please make sure you remember to do that. Uh, I'll remind you towards the end. OK, uh, we've got a uh, good attendance this, this evening. So there will be probably others who are going to join us uh, if they're a bit late. Uh, so let's go and start. So I'm going to start showing you my screen. Green. Uh, you should be able to see my screen. Can you all type in to say if you can see the, the front slide? Great, looks like all of you can see my front slide. Um, and let's see if I want to know if um, I just want to sometimes can you see my marker can everyone see my marker the blue marker great okay so uh, last time as I'm doing these presentations a lot of people can't see my pointer so hopefully it works this time so let's start okay um, what do patients really look for. Uh, many of you have probably done many anterior implants by now and I know some of you are very experienced and some of you are uh, in a transition stage of you know beginners to uh, competent uh, implantologists but um, I think the most thing, uh, most important thing about doing implants in the anterior region is, can you meet this patient's expectations? Um, what can really be achieved clinically uh, with what the patient's dimensions, uh, with the current patient's dimensions in terms of gingival profile, uh, quality of bone, volume of bone? Um, and really more and more patients are, are, know that implants work and their main focus is on the aesthetics that is going to be produced. Uh, we all know that we've got to place our implants in a three-dimensional, in the correct three-dimensional manner. So the etiology of a lot of these complications in the uh, in the single anterior implant uh, results, uh, and from my experience uh, and a lot of others, it's primarily the knowledge of the implantologist of, of the anatomy uh, of the, the ha anatomy of the gingival tissues, the bone healing responses uh, after doing surgery not looking at the occlusion properly, uh, not really knowing all the various restorative options available for that implant type and design, um, not having enough ginger, uh, micro uh, surgical gingival skills to also correct problems. Um, there's not uh, uh, enough understanding in the anterior maxillary anatomy. Um, incorrect analysis uh, uh, of, of where to put the implant head and not putting it in the correct horizontal, horizontal, uh, horizontal or vertical plane. Obviously putting, uh, putting the implant in the uh, incorrect position and um, creating a deficient papillae 
uh, which not which not only is anesthetic but results in food impaction and speech problems. Now, later on, we'll have lots of examples and we'll hopefully together work out what went wrong and what we've got to consider uh, prior to taking some of these cases on. So, uh, the, um, the most of you will have heard and you should know about the Tarno rule, uh, but just to refresh your memory, uh, the Tarno rule, uh, uh, let's put this pen on. The Tarno rule uh, says that if your if the if the height of the, the contact between the implant and the adjacent tooth here and the height of the bone here is less than five millimeters, then in 98% of the cases, you should have a papillae formed. Um, and if the height of the bone here to the contact of uh, the mid contact of the crowns is six millimeters, then you will only get papillae formed in 57 uh, percent of the cases. And then uh, subsequently seven millimeters uh, distance, you get only a papillae formed in 27. So it doesn't always mean that if you placed your implant at the wrong height, that you won't necessarily get a papillae, but your chances are significantly diminished if you start placing the implant uh, head a little bit lower or if you've got bone recession around the neck of the implant. Um, okay, uh, next. So the causes of the loss of uh, loss of papillae, uh, obviously people with a history of perio disease. So if they're presenting to you with lots of uh, perio disease, uh, you shouldn't be really doing implants in them anyway. But if you've got the perio disease controlled <coughs> and you've got um, a significant reduction in your pocket depths, of, most of the time you will uh, lose your interdental papillae to a degree, it won't be so um, prominent. And these patients, uh, if their expectations are to have the perfect gingival anatomy, then uh, you've got to make them realize it's not, it's not really going to be that easy. Um, if there's history of trauma, if there's a significant, uh, if there's a traumatic extraction or you've lost the buc buccal plate, it makes the uh, creation of the papillae even harder. Uh, root resorption uh, and restoration, restoration is leading to a deficiency in the interproximal soft tissue uh, uh, and the damage could be iatrogenic. In other words, you yourself have uh, you know, caused that papillae to be lost by uh, inadvertently taking the tooth out and maybe uh, losing the interdental bone uh, and therefore the loss of papillae. What are some of the ways where you can regrow or uh, move uh, the bone uh, more uh, crestally? Uh, one of the ways is to uh, use orthodontics as a forced extraction. To be honest with you, I've not done this myself, but I know colleagues uh, who do do this. Um, I do orthodontics prior to implants, but I've never forced an extraction, uh, nor forced a root uh, uh, crestally uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, and so allowing the bone to move forward. But I found this case, which uh, shows quite nicely uh, that this can be done. Have any of you uh, done forced orthodontic extraction at all? Has anyone out there uh, done that who could enlighten us? No, most of you haven't. But if you have, 
do most of you do ortho at all? Does anyone uh, in the in the, in the lecture room do ortho? Sigendra does. Uh, anyone else? Suresh, yeah. Jenna, uh, adult alignment only, yeah. Uh, Chris, short term ortho, I should know, yeah. For the people who, uh, thank you everyone. Um, <clears throat> if you don't do ortho, I would suggest you uh, at least create a partnership with someone in the practice or an associated practice that can do ortho. Uh, in my experience, orthodontics is very important to correct placement of implants primarily because if your tooth positions aren't correct or if you haven't got the right mesial, dis mesial uh, distal distances in your uh, potential implant sites orthodontics is a magic way of ensuring that uh, your dimensions prior to placing an implant are correct uh, and i would strongly encourage uh, all of you uh, or the, the people who don't do orthodontics or do orthodontics but haven't got experience in space uh, widening to to you know contact a colleague orthodontist or a colleague who is used to doing it to show how much easier it is to place implants in the correctly uh, formed site by orthodontics um, so uh, um, you know the the forced extraction is is one thing, but orthodontics combined with the uh, creating uh, you know in order to create the ideal surgical site is also very very important in my view. So uh, please take that on board. Uh, how many of you out there are using periotomes? Uh, if you could just type in. Good. It's nice to see that virtually all of you are. Um, and, you know, it, it is uh, once you've got the right handle, right grip, uh, right technique, it is a great way of taking teeth out atraumatically. A combination of various different, uh, you know, uh, round techniques. You know, there's very there, there's lots of different handles you can get with periotome, something that you can really hold tight. Uh, and get round the tooth uh, uh, and the technique. It is very technique sensitive to a degree, but once you've got it uh, mastered, uh, it, it's a great way of maintaining your uh, bone in, bone architecture uh, and therefore your soft tissues. You should all be using uh, socket preservation techniques now. Uh, it is uh, considered to be, uh, on all accounts, to be the right way forward to maintain your soft tissue architecture. Um, can I ask uh, all of you, who is using PRF? Is uh, How many of you are using PRF right now? Okay. okay, so looks like majority of you guys are, are brilliant, good. Yeah, I know Dave Rhodes is a big PRF user. Let's try to get a tissue. But um, I would... Uh, I would inc I, um, I'm hoping that one of the lectures soon, I did ask David Rhodes to uh, talk to us on PRF. I use PRF all the time uh, for my socket preservation. I combine it with a xenograft um, and uh, I've had, this is a case where I've used uh, PRF uh, and this is before and this is after. Uh, and you can see the sort of soft tissue architecture I can get. Uh, this is a, a patient who I did an implant for probably about uh, six years ago. She came back and really wasn't unhappy was unhappy with the gingival profile here. Uh, I took the abutment off. I regrafted the whole area with PRF and some bios. I waited for the uh, uh, 
bone to heal. I put a good gingival um, healing temporary crown and eventually I finished it with a final crown. I redid that composite measly as well and I managed to get something that she was happy with and she was very, very difficult to get happy as well. Uh, <sighs> I worked together with the technician uh, and he did all the shade matching uh, and the contouring as well. So a uh, little tip, um, my view is that um, girls are quite difficult to please anteriorly uh, from my experience, um, no pun intended, but really you need to make sure you have covered absolutely all the bases, get the technician involved, take photographs, show the patient exactly what the problems are, make sure they realise how difficult the case is, and then don't make out that you can do something very uh, quickly and easily without uh, all um, the necessary uh, actions. Great, Neil. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I, yeah, that's right, Neil. Uh, thank you for telling us you did your project on PRF. Maybe you can present your PRF project to us one evening, so uh, um, and that would be really helpful. Uh, Suresh, did I close over with PRF? Yes. What I did is I, uh, I, what I, yeah, what I did here is I actually took the implant, uh, the uh, the implant back to its cover screw. I then grafted and put PRF and then stitched the whole thing over, and then I put a healing cap. And then I did a carbon fiber bridge on her as a temporary. Then I put a healing cap. Then I did a crown. So I really went all the way back to uh, back to the implant head and regrafted the whole area. So yeah, not very very popular with the patient when you have to do it like that. But the result will be much much better in the long run. The patients will be able to recognize that uh, you know uh, that they you know that that it's a better result. They won't like the fact that they all think it can be you know, healed and done very quickly. But in my view, you do have to almost go right back. Uh, it's very difficult to grow gingival tissues or recontour if there's an existing crown because it's all governed by the crown that's there anyway. Uh, if you started afresh, a you've got the chance to mould and manipulate the gingiva uh, to a new shape and a new contour. And that's what I, that's the difference between that crown, the old crown that I did, and the new crown that I did. So, um, okay, um, so socket preservation techniques, uh, pl uh, please don't uh, forget that. Uh, the PRF uh, can come as a sort of a plug as well. That works incredibly well. But all of these work really well. You know, the xenografts, the allografts, uh, the alloplasts, they all work. I've used all of them, and I'm sure a lot of you have used uh, many of these that you can vouch for. Suresh, uh, so was it to increase the soft tissue bulk and not hard tissue? Yeah, it was to increase the keratinized volume. So I'm finding with PRF, I get good keratinized tissue around the area as well. So it was mainly the soft tissue bulk that I needed to recreate the gingival uh, architecture. Okay. So just many of you will know this slide and many of you will probably, uh, um, you know, remember this every time you're placing implants. But just to refresh your memory, when you're doing two or more implants in the anterior region, uh, planning is crucial uh, to, to ensure that, you know, you, you, can, you can create the papillae around your implants. Um, so always measure uh, the distance uh, of the proximal bone here to, the, to your potential contact point uh, and then look towards placing your implant accordingly into that height. Your implant neck should allow you to create the uh, correct biological width and allow for, a, uh, so therefore allow a good gingival architecture and your interproximal uh, papillae. Um, 
but don't make out with the patient that it's just an easy ride. It is one of the most difficult things to recreate in implant dentistry. It's all well and good doing posterior implants because you don't generally worry about the, uh, um, the papillae in, in between. Um, so, uh, you know, always let the patients know what the difficulties are. And if you don't think you can create a really lovely papillae, then you may have to have a long contact point and you'll tell the patient this is what it's likely to look like. Chris says, how do you use the xenograft if you're just using technique, uh, this as a sole socket preservation technique? Uh, the BIOS uh, is probably the um, one that everyone knows, but they come in granules. What I tend to do with that is I uh, would um, use, uh, maybe harvest some of the blood that's in, in the area into a syringe. I'd use, uh, I'd mix it with the xenograft granules. I don't tend to crush the xenograft granules too much. I mix it in uh, with the blood in a sterile um, dish, and then I would just fill the socket. Uh, some of the time I would, uh, I would place uh, a, a pig tendon membrane, something like Biguide, and then I would, close with primary intention in other words do an APC reposition flap uh, and sometimes I would do a split gingival palatal flap in other words drag the palatal gingivae over to try and get uh, keratinized tissue over the socket site Chris um, I'm not sure if you've seen how to do a, a split gingival palatal flap uh, but it's a great way of pulling the palatal tissues uh, or enhancing the keratinized volume around the neck of the implants. Okay. Having poor gingival emergence profile is probably due to placing the implant too palatally or too lingually. Uh, and you're doing this because you want to put the implant in the most available bone. The problem is it'll create uh, the incorrect gingival profile, so it won't look as if it's like uh, the other adjacent teeth. It will always look false because you've left, you know, your you, the, the the body of the implant is not in harmony or in the same sort of plane as the adjacent teeth and you'll end up correcting by placing too much composite uh, here uh, and uh, to, uh, or pink ceramic which will never ever look the same so you, you are much much better off uh, making sure you've got enough volume of bone to place the implant in the correct uh, three-dimensional position uh, 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 relative to the adjacent teeth. So, um, so if you haven't got good gingival biotype, in other words, it looks very thin and uh, there's not good keratinized tissue and volume there, then you should graft with soft uh, with connective tissue or um, uh, into that area, maybe keratinized tissue or co uh, connective tissue graft into that area prior to placing that implant. Um, and by enhancing the volume and the, 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 the structure of the tissue, uh, when you come to uh, recontour the tissues by using various uh, emergence uh, um, healing abutments, you're more likely to create the right uh, envelope for the crown to sit into. Now, um, out of curiosity, um, how many of you uh, are doing uh, connective tissue grafts, I wonder, or know how to do, or, or, or just out of curiosity? Okay. Right, I think one of our uh, one of okay, one of the one of the lectures uh, before that uh, that uh, that's been done. I've covered um, connective tissue grafts, and uh, I 
would suggest that if you don't know how to do them now, that you ask your mentor uh, to or your supervisor to show you a case and maybe you could assist in a case where he's collecting a connective tissue graft and maybe if a case you do have um, of your patient that your supervisor could help you because that skill is invaluable in getting you out of trouble with complications in the anterior region uh, and recognizing that. Are there any courses you would recommend for PRF and soft tissue management? The, the PRF course uh, is a course uh, I use um, uh, ch children's, um, children's PRF unit. He's a French guy uh, and very, very popular unit in the UK. I believe... Um, um, one of the implant companies, I forget their name, but they supply that unit. Uh, the other, yeah, Chalker, and that's him. Uh, the other guy who does, um, the other guy who does uh, a lot of PRF, and the, the course that I went on him is Eduardo Anitio. So that's the guy, that's the book. Uh, he, he, he runs a two-day course in Spain, and I did it probably about two or three years ago, and that was uh, very, very useful. But the Chalkran uh, guy, that's it, General Medical. That's correct, Neil. Um, uh, they do that. Uh, but the but Chalkran's, uh, Chalkran also runs courses. He runs two-day courses, and you can, if you just, punch in his name you'll come up a, uh, on a website and he covers all this very very well in his course I actually haven't been on his course because I, I did this other course but I, you know the guys have been on it said it's absolutely brilliant I've heard the guy speak and it's amazing it, you, you'll get converted to PRF once you listen to and see the see the evidence Neil you're saying the process for PRF how does it work do you mean Um, Chris, did I? Should I said, uh, do you always close over the socket? I've seen many people put xenografts in the socket and placing collagen sponges over the top or resolvable membrane. Would it be helpful to know what is the best protocol? Well, my view is that if um, I feel that you, the way I do it and the way I've, all, I've always done it is I've always closed up with primary intention. I don't trust... Uh, the resorbable membrane uh, or leaving exposed in any way. I don't trust leaving any graft material exposed in any way. I would much, much prefer it has a blood supply coming uh, coronally. So, you know, that's what I've always done. And it, in all honesty, most of the time has worked for me, Suresh. Um, okay, uh, Chris, is there any courses? I'm making sure that I've, I've, I'm answering all these questions as you're throwing them at me. Uh, if you Google that, that's yeah, that's Chalkran's thing. Oh, that's it. Great, Neil. Well done. That's the that's the website. If everyone wants to make a note of it, uh, I recall it now. Okay, good. Um, let's carry on. Um, and uh, so I find bicol technique is pretty. Yes, uh, James. I believe I, I I I I used to use that technique, and that works really well as well. Okay. Uh, right, in patients with thin biotypes, I've said a connective tissue graft is frequently recommended. Uh, it would, um, the procedure would often uh, involve exposing the implant neck and making it less likely for the tissue. So as I mentioned, just as I said in the other case, you know, you would have to almost get down to the tissue neck and expose it. Uh, this particular case here uh, is case an example that you've probably placed the implant a bit too uh, plately or lingually, and you're going to have to use an abutment which has got a distinct uh, curve 
to try and replicate the emergence profile uh, from the adjacent teeth. So this is one way out of it. Um, and really, you need to use a very, very good technician who really understands emergence profiles to get you out of uh, uh, a situation where you've had to place the implant too palatally. Uh, and also, to, uh, if you've ended up placing the implant too apically, then you need to have a material uh, that touches your soft tissues, which the soft tissues really like. And in my experience, the material that the soft tissues really like is polished metal, gold, you know, or, or polished titanium. The tissues will more likely stay there. Uh, uh, in other words, you won't get uh, plaque and debris won't collect so easily. Whereas with a sl uh, you know, slightly rougher surface like porcelain, uh, its plaque and debris are more likely to stick. Uh, and if you can't get the patient to clean it very well, they'll get uh, from time to time a little pimple of pus forming because the bacteria just haven't been removed. Um, a lot, again, is to do with the connection. If you've got a connection uh, here and you've got constant swelling, uh, if the patient's not keeping that connection made between the abutment and the actual crown, again, uh, you know, you're, you could be likely for the gums to recede and uh, for small uh, area of infection to develop. So this is, uh, this is just a summary of the, uh, sorry, summary of the dimensions that you should know, all know about. Uh, so you want the final uh, gingival contour, uh, including the buccal bone, to be about 1.8 millimeters. Uh, you want to be a minimum of 1.5 millimeters from the adjacent teeth. And the two body of the implants should have ideally a minimum of three millimeters to give you plenty of chance to get your implants in the right position and give you the right orientation. If you can't maintain these dimensions, you and your technician will have to really work to make sure you can recreate uh, the gingival architecture as well as the profile of the crown to give you as harmonious appearance as possible. So planning is ever so important. So you should have study models, you should work out where the implant neck should be, where the head should be, and measure on the model, actually mark it out. In some cases, I actually mark it out where all the distances are, photograph it, enter it into the records, show the planning. Uh, because if you're criticised in showing that uh, you've not put the implant in the right position, at least uh, you can show the planning that you've done to make, you know, that you've uh, tried to get there in the right position. George, new research has shown that platform switch implants, it may be less than three millimetres now, even approximately, yes. Uh, thank you, George. As we all know, platform switched implants have given us a massive amount of uh, leeway uh, and um, certainly placing the implants a bit more sub uh, subcrestally uh, will allow us to not cheat, but actually uh, uh, give us a little bit more freedom in, in some of these dimensions, but not all of us are using platform switched implants in the anterior region. Most of us are still using uh, uh, conventional implants in these areas, but um, you know it's an option that you should consider. Thank you, George. Um, the, a surgical guide should show the surgeon its final anticipated crown margin. Yeah, so you know you should have uh, your guide ready. Your guide should be able to show you where the final margin it should be uh, and where you place your uh, guide uh, I'll just put this where you place your guide say if it was here 
uh, that uh, you should it should help you where help you determine where the um, crestal part of the uh, implant should be so that the, the neck of the implant should be so uh, it's so the guide is not only giving you a, uh, a place where uh, buckle palatally it should be but also vertically but because your guide should have uh, your technician should have created a, 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 a mark or, or a profile where the ventral gum should be uh, if you've not tried this uh, I, I would strongly encourage you not to just use the guide for orientation of the implant in the, 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 the buccal palatal plane, mesial distal plane, but also for the, uh, the, the height. So um, the standard four mil implant uh, should have uh, roughly seven milli uh, space. That's, as I said, 1.5 millimeters between the adjacent teeth. Narrow, narrow three mil implants uh, should have a distance ideally of five to six. I've got some cases coming up in a little while, which will show you some quite difficult uh, uh, restorative problems uh, in this area. So it's, uh, we're gonna talk about narrow implants and just wanna call uh, from all of you there, um, if you could just write down the narrowest implants you're all using, uh, just to, just to get give me a feel of uh, who's out there. Three mil, three mil, Azam three mil, uh, George three mil, Suresh three point five. Yep. So we're all using about three mil as our as our smallest. Some of us are using three point five. Uh, so. I don't know, is anyone using, and I don't really like to hear it, but is anyone, anyone using the, um, the sort of dentata screw? Oh, uh, George using 2.9. Is anyone using those dentata screw mini implants? Um, nope, nope. Good, good, yeah. There's been quite a lot of con controversy out there, and I'd rather... Uh, rather honestly that we don't use uh, too many of those in fact you don't use them at all uh, because there's been plenty of litigation cases with those types of implants failing they can work and I've seen many many cases where they have worked really well but um, I think if we all stick to the three mil implants uh, you know we're we're pretty safe. Uh, AJ, how much uh, of the primary stability and bone implant contact can one compromise for the sake of ideal uh, positioning? The problem is, AJ, that uh, you will be judged obviously on the, the, the integration in terms of whether the implant stays in, but most of the implants, the prognosis is still good in grafted bone. So you should ideally graft the area if you feel that you can't get it in the mesial distal uh, sorry, uh, buccal palatal orientation. If your space is compromised mesial and distally, then you have to really make sure that the patient understands what the final architecture of the crown is likely to be uh, and give them a good idea and consent that to that. Orthodontics, again, to open up the space, maybe some um, interproximal reduction with the patient's consent. Uh, uh, if the if the teeth adjacent to it have crowns, maybe the crowns could be made smaller, slightly mesial distally, so that you can get a uh, good architecture of uh, the crown. Uh, when you're placing when you're placing implants in a situation like this, where you've got very very limited bone. Uh, and you, you're, it's very narrow as well. Uh, your positioning has to be absolutely perfect. Uh, so either guided or uh, maybe even two of you uh, working together to make sure that uh, you, you know, your, your path of insertion is perfect. Uh, it's not only just getting the implant in, it's all well and good if you look at this particular one here, you, you've got he's got the implant in probably a, a, as good a position he get but ha, what it what is the implant going to look like when it finishes 
uh, what is the crown going to look like? Is it, you know, is it going to end up looking like something like that? You could compromise and, uh, you know, make the crown look like this. But again, it's just you're not going to create a really nice emergence profile uh, and it might be difficult. So lots of planning is involved. You've got to be sure that uh, you've explained everything to the patient here. Uh, you, you know, ideally, the gum should have been about here, maybe. Uh, so, you know, we we could have corrected it by uh, placing the implant in the correct position. Uh, maybe do some gingival contouring to get that in the right place as well. So um, narrow implants are difficult, um, and when you are doing them, you must make sure that the patient fully consents to the the final aesthetic architecture, and that they're fully aware of what the crown is likely to look look like uh, and, and the difficulties that you have. In the anterior region, do you choose between a screw or a cement retained uh, implant? Um, in all honesty, I haven't got a massive preference to either two. I let my technician help me make the decision on this. A lot of it is to do with the bite, a lot of it is to do with the orientation of the teeth. Uh, of course, it's got to do with the guidance on the, uh, on the implant as well. Uh, but you should also con uh, consider uh, retrievability. And uh, if your connection is, is, uh, is, is um, it, if the tooth that you're replacing the implant uh, if the implant is the tooth you're replacing, then uh, you should really make sure that if it is canine guided, that you've got a, a facility to retrieve the screw loosening if there is screw loosening in that area. So, um, uh, it, you know, it carries, uh, there's going to be a lecture later on on prosthetic complications, uh, but fracturing of screws on um, teeth is another major problem. Uh, and um, we're going to cover a little bit later on how to remove fractured screws from implants. Can we, just, can we all just have a show? How many of you had, have had a complication like this uh, happen to you? Oh, it's nice to see that a few more. <laughs> Don't worry, Neil, it'll come. It'll come. It's nice to see that a few of you have had it. George, I'm suppose um, I can't be. Uh, I've seen referrals sent to me. Yeah, happens. Uh, happens relatively not common, but I'm glad to see that we've all had it. And uh, uh, a little tip, which I'm sure you all know about, is the ultrasonic uh, to try and uh, loosen the screw, and then uh, keep putting the ultrasonic inside the well uh, in an anti-clockwise manner and it should derotate out it's ha it's been successful for me for all the ones that i i've done and i've even uh, created a slight little slot onto the head of the screw and <laughs> yeah refer it to george otherwise yeah if you if you don't want to take it on uh, but it is quite easy to remove a fractured screw and all the ones that I've had. Um, and I think uh, certainly uh, you should refer if you're not comfortable. So the expectations, uh, the, the, the prevention and treatment of the complication, it's the expectation of the patient uh, should be well defined and discussed at the uh, initial appointment. You've got to make sure the patient understands what you're trying to create in terms of the gingival profile uh, and all, obviously the color matching as well. Document all your all the patient's expectations and the limitations you've told the patient before the final treatment plan. Oh, George, I've not heard of endofreeze, uh, so you may have to tell us a little bit more about endofreeze. Uh, uh, <laughs> <coughs> Um, so, um, no, I've not heard about endofreeze, so you might have to tell us a little bit more about endofreeze, by the way. Um, 
Uh, make sure maybe the prostodontist who's going to talk to us. Uh, we've got we've got a specialist prostodontist talking to, to at the next uh, implant meeting, and uh, I'll ask him if he's uh, if he can talk to us on on that. So document all your expectation limitations before the final treatment plan. Um, make sure all the alternative options have been uh, informed and they understand fully the step sequence and. Tell them about the risks of failure, uh, especially the gingival problems that you have. So don't make it your own problem. Share the problem with the patient as well. Share the risk with the patient. Um, a lot of this, uh, this slide uh, is uh, something that you would have probably covered in your aesthetic assessments when you were doing your cases. You'd have to uh, discuss the aesthetic uh, risk analysis, uh, but this is just to refresh your memory uh, of all the aesthetic checklists checklists that you should be carrying out. Uh, I'm not going to go into a tremendous detail here, but uh, it's important to make a note of this in your consultation notes so that uh, the um, you know anyone else looking at your case can see the planning that's gone into it. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to put some cases on and I'd like you all uh, to say what the problem is here, what, what do you see as the problem uh, and then, yep, and just, just write down what you think is the problem. So Chris is too buckle, yes James, it's, the implants are definitely too close. Um, anything about the gum? Uh, too far buckle, too close. Yeah, implant space too close. Implicit, implicit. Yep, good. Not good. Very good. Not enough keratinized tissue. Good. Thin biotype. Improper positioning. Thank you, George. Unkeratinized. Yep. Cement. Yeah, probably. Uh, the cement too far buckle. Correct. Uh, okay. So most of you have got it. Uh, what do you think? Um, what do you think this particular dentist? Very prone to recession. Yep. Thank you very much. What do you think in the planning they didn't do? If you can just write down. Uh, if you don't, just write down what part in the planning do you think they failed? Space. Thank you, Neil. Volume. Well done, George. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Most everything. Uh, assess the distance, positioning. Thank you, Jennifer. Did not consider the space. Uh, biotype. Thank you very much, James. And three-dimensional planning and the tissue type. Thank you, AJ. Yep, they look. He didn't really look at the scallop bioform and didn't realise he needed more tissues. So, so really, on this particular case, if we have a look. Uh, just to summarize the things that we've talked about, we didn't look at the gingival architecture here, and obviously it's deficient quite a lot, but then it rides up here. So the probability of holding the bone up to here, in view of the fact that the this bone is at this level, it is going to be difficult to try and maintain that soft tissue at that level. Uh, so if, if the patient's expecting all the soft tissue to be there, it's going to be a challenge because the adjacent bone crestally has lost bone up to here anyway, although he's kept bone here. So it's going to be slightly unpredictable knowing where this soft, uh, where the bone is going to end up and where the soft tissue is going, going to end up. Uh, also, if you think about it, I haven't got the full smile line, but, you know, the, the gum juts up here and it drops down here. So there's going to, aesthetically, the patient needs to understand what the, what the options are here. If you do create enough bone and uh, gum soft tissue in that area, um, is this going to look aesthetic? So the patient needs to sort of uh, understand what his options are here. Yep, uh, certainly he could have imported more keratinized tissue around here before he started. Uh, it probably needed a bit more bone. You're right. Most of you have said that. Uh, the bone, 
uh, you know, there wasn't, the implants were placed too buckle. Um, he didn't have the right quality of bone, uh, or rather the tissues here. Um, and uh, the, the implants were too close. You know, the one, one head is here and the other head is here. So ideally the, the head could have been a bit more central here and a bit more central here. So a little bit wider apart as well. Um, so yeah, so a lot of a lot of you've got those uh, uh, bits right. And the orientation of the implant looks as if it's going in this plane almost. And this one's going in this plane here. So, um, okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, so uh, if you all can just uh, say what, so this is a tooth, by the way, okay? By the way, this is, uh, there's a tooth here. Oh, there's a tooth here. So what do you think is gonna be the aesthetic complication here? And what do you think they've uh, done wrong? Yep, too apical, too buckled, insipid bone, too long a tooth. Yep, too apical. Angulation, yep, it's came out too buckle, too buckle. Um, okay, right. So now you all know, I'm just going to give you a, a couple of problems. I'm the patient, and I would like to make sure that I've got my gingival profile here. Okay, I've got the implant in that position. Uh, what would you suggest to correct this problem now? Yep, remove implant, explant, yep. Removal, removal and start again. Yep. Yep, good. Okay, uh, after you've taken out the implant, um, good technician and pink porcelain, possibly, possibly, uh, uh, Sagendran, I think it would be difficult though to get a very, very a good enough profile here. Remember, I'm a very fussy patient, so, uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, bone block and, yeah, bitos, yeah, good. So I think once you remove the implant, you have to replace uh, the volume of bone and, um, and I think it will be a block graft uh, and it will have to fill the bone in uh, quite a bit. And the patient's got to understand it's a very long process as well. Um, for, the, for all of you who are not uh, a fay with uh, removing implants and uh, haven't got the, there's a kit out there where, uh, to removing implants or trafining implants out, then you should refer because there will be massive soft tissue and bone loss when that happens and the patient will have to go through quite a significant amount of uh, grafting <coughs> with the whole thing. Okay, <coughs> uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, so, I mean, the orientation of the tooth is correct. Uh, uh, let's have a look at how would you all, what do you all see? So I'm the patient. I'll just tell you what my problem is. I don't want this profile. I want my gum margin to be here. The implant is obviously here. How would uh, how would you all go uh, to correct this now? I feel you're all diagnosing correctly, but I'd like like an idea now on how you would go to correct this. What would you what sort of the things that I've gone through that things that uh, the cases that I've shown you remove? Yeah, James, correct. Remove crown, abutment, bone graft, and CT. A graph, definitely one option. Uh, there is a there is a uh, a problem, a, a, a comp not a complication, a recognised difficulty in that. James, um, increase. I'll go come back to that. James, 
Increased keratinized tissue, yes. So again, no, that could be a possible. Explant, George, yes. Uh, pink porcelain, correct. I don't like using pink porcelain, never really worked. Connective tissue graft and buried implant, yes. Chris, that will work. Aisha, yes. Connective tissue graft, happy with that as well. Um, so the, the, the technique of taking the implant, taking the crown off, Going back to the actual cover screw, um, uh, yep, there's an option of, of, of removing the implant as well. But I think in my, my view, before you, before you remove the implant, there is another thing that you can try. And uh, George, uh, sorry, um, uh, um, James has touched it, and most of you have actually uh, uh, touched on it. Um, I would have I would have graft I would graft probably uh, using uh, connective tissue graft palatal uh, split gingival rotational palatal flap and uh, and then bulk up the tissues and just suture over and give the patient uh, maybe a carbon fiber bridge just to allow the area to heal and bulk up the volume and then come backwards on that and try and contour the uh, new crown so it's this shape and uh, 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 so I do a temporary crown first to get it to this shape and then slowly build up uh, um, the architecture that way. Um, the difficulty is, I was saying to James, is when you've got the head there and you've got this amount of tissue, which is almost unsupported uh, by bone, that it is vulnerable to um very small uh reddening and infection not infections but uh spicules of uh, sort of debris collecting underneath so you really have to show the patient how to keep it clean and as i mentioned it you should i prefer using a polished collar uh underneath that with the porcelain starting just about a mill just underneath that collar uh, so that way the patient can keep it clean and the way I show the patient how to keep that part very clean is uh, I ask them to floss and sort of wrap it around into a sort of a figure of eight type of uh, shape uh, and so that the floss almost uh, goes around the whole circumference of that polished collar. Um, uh, the higher the head, uh, the more difficult it is to uh, create that uh, soft tissue architecture and the more difficult it is for the patient to keep it clean uh, but it can work <coughs> in a lot of the circumstances if their head is not too high uh, so uh, yeah x floss technique okay what happens here and how do we prevent this okay so patients got um, a midline. Oops, hang on, let's get back. There's the patient's midline here. Uh, patients, they've had this implant put in. Obviously, a big gap there and a big gap the other side. Right, guys, any idea of what to do here uh, and how would you possibly? improve this so I would want I'd like my diastomers completely closed uh, and I'd like a correction in my uh, uh, I'd like a correction in my midline so in other words I want all my diastomers closed and I want symmetry in my smile uh, my problem that I'm not happy with is this gum here and the fact that obviously the crown is completely the wrong shape. Chris, uh, remove implant and do ortho. Yep, happy with that. Pre-treat ortho, happy with that. George, explant and ortho. Yep, happy with that. Three unit conventional bridge. Uh, yeah, it's an option, definitely. Ortho, new abutment, crown and CT graft. Thank you, James. Happy with that. Um, okay, so uh, Chris, could you use implant and bring bone with, uh, bring 
with it before remove. Could you use the implant to bring bone with it um, before removing? Yeah, what you mean, growing implants, growing bone around the implant? I think that would be difficult. Uh, via also, okay. Mm. No, because the implant would be totally integrated, wouldn't it, George? Uh, wouldn't it, Chris? That would be difficult. Um, okay, so in a case like this, uh, all of you have hinted uh, and certainly uh, are all very, very acceptable solutions. Um, what, what would I do? I would definitely remove the implant uh, first. Yep, correct the ortho, correct his midline if he wants it mid, uh, corrected. Wax it up then and show the patient what the positioning of the teeth are going to be like. And then, uh, and then from that, if he's happy, then uh, look to place, uh, uh, if I can't get two good size implants in position, uh, or you know the right size implants in position, then I would probably go for one implant and then cantilever off the one implant uh, because it's, in my view, it's much worse to try and put in two implants into a narrow gap uh, or a gap that potentially uh, looks like it needs to uh, and then really try and make the whole thing uh, uh, restoratively pleasing. So, um, AJ, you're saying ortho restorative corrections on adjacent teeth and attempt a better position at that time. Yep, exactly right. You know, you're using the ortho to really improve your orientation of the adjacent teeth so as you can get a very good uh, natural uh, smile throughout. So, um, here, uh, you know, you may well have to uh, do uh, bone grafting, soft tissue grafting. Uh, 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 after all the ortho is finished and then uh, work out through your planning exactly whether you want to put a central implant and distal cantilever or, uh, or, or uh, 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 I mean obviously you'd have to wax the whole thing up anyway to be honest with you uh, and that'll help you work out um, uh, where, the, where the best position of the implant is. Obviously in this case you'd want to ortho and try and just give you enough space to give you just one tooth but if you did have a case where you had two a space for two teeth then uh, you could either widen it up let's say you have, you're missing the two as well but you didn't have enough space to put two good sized teeth in then I would uh, I would put a, an implant then distal cantilever for the two uh, to create uh, uh, a pleasing smile. Okay so uh, we can see what happened here and in fact uh, you don't need to really all comment uh, obviously the implants are way too close here uh, and um, it'll be impossible to try and clean the head of these implants here uh, uh, and the patient will have tremendous problems okay so what if you were the dentist that did this okay uh, what would your options be now and what would you do on this particular case? How would you restoratively correct this or what would you do? Expand and bridge, expand and bridge, restore one only. Thank you, James. That's probably what I would do. Remove one implant, leave one. Yeah, and cantilever. Yeah, as I'm happy with that. Uh, try and remove one of them and if the other has integrated. Yep, happy with that, Chris. Remove one and cancel it. Yeah, well done, guys. You've got it. Uh, you know, it's not all is lost. And I've done this many times where I've been referred or I myself have made a mistake and put two too close together. Totally explain it to the patients. Explain what you're doing, why you're doing it so that they fully understand. Uh, and you can still get a very good aesthetic result. Remove one and use wild one. Yep, correct. Uh, leave one implant. Surely you will end up with bone loss. You could end up with bone loss to a degree, and it'll be difficult for them to keep it clean. But I've uh, it ha in the few cases that I've had in my time, uh, it's all worked really well. Patients almost like it. They feel that they've got another one in the bank if anything ever happens to that one other implant. So uh, you know, you turn it around a little bit. Okay, uh, let's go. Okay, it's a summary. Um, 
uh, take good digital pictures, give the patient more than one option. Um, really make sure that they're clear of the expectations, uh, have good treatment planning and biological limitation, uh, and make sure the patient's aware of their biological limitation. Uh, make sure they fully understand the difficulties that you're possibly going to have and ask them questions. Um, uh, Chris is saying, would you favor just restoring one and leaving the other rather than removing one? Yeah, as I said, I would just uh, would just restore one of them, Chris. Uh, make sure you show good communication with the laboratory uh, and the, contact the technician and ceramist and let them have a look at the case and uh, give the, give them an eye uh, thumbs up on what's potentially coming their way. Um, Always show them what a poten your, their potential final crown is going to look like with the provisional. Make sure they're happy with the provisional before you proceed to the final. Um, and with these types of cases where it's where soft tissue is the difficult problem, then you need lots of patients because it takes ages uh, for it to. Um, <laughs> just about yeah you're right George just it is embarrassing leaving it that as the but it's, it's way you word it sometimes um, the uh, yeah so when you're doing soft tissue grafting it takes ages to get the right tissues the way you really want it so uh, in all honesty I would um, I would let the patient know it's going to take a long time uh, and give them give them an idea of how what the time scales are uh, always make sure you follow up your all your implant patients, but uh, especially the ones in the aesthetic region, because you really want to be sure that the gum stays there and the patient's keeping it very clean in, indeed. Um, so also make sure that you've got a very good implant hygiene program and they understand how important it is to keep it uh, clean. Right, guys. Uh, it was, it was about an hour, so I hope I haven't bored you all to death. Uh, um, yeah, CBCP guided surgery helps a lot. I haven't covered that in great detail. I wanted to just cover the uh, uh, the raw essentials. Uh, we have got another uh, uh, session booked on CBCT planning guided surgeries, especially in difficult implant cases. So, but certainly uh, it really does help if you've got a CBCT guide uh, in those places as well. Um, anyway, guys, if I could ask you all to leave a comment on uh, the chat box, really, on how you enjoy uh, what you uh, thought of tonight. And uh, the next meeting uh, will be. It, on a Wednesday, and it will probably be um, the speaker, I think he wanted to go for the 30th of November, the 30th of November. So um, if you can all make sure you're going to be there, the speaker's name is Asif Ahmed. He's a prosthodontist specialist at, uh, uh, I think he's at the London, and he's agreed to do a, uh, a series of three lectures on prostodontic complications with implants. So um, I think it'll be really good and uh, um, I hope you all enjoy it. Um, I'm making contact with him uh, tomorrow and then I'll put out on the platform uh, the date. But as I said, it's likely to be the 30th. That's Wednesday, the 30th of November. So um, I hope you can all join us. So again, please make sure you leave some comments uh, about tonight's session. Um, and uh, thank you for joining. If, you, uh, if you've got any questions, um, the, if you've got any uh, uh, um, questions, please don't hesitate to sort of email me. This presentation will go on the um, portfolio. Um, and uh, you can then have a look. Um, Jen, Jennifer Mountjoy, can you just stay online for a little bit longer? I just want to have a little chat uh, as to how you're progressing uh, with your cases. So just hang on, Jen, okay? And I'll talk to you. 
Um, Suresh, uh, Minesh, one issue I wanted to hear about more, uh, how to model tips and tailor with custom abutments. Suresh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, I've done, uh, um, I've done a, a previous uh, lecture was on that with the custom abutment. So I covered that in the implant study group just for, just before this one. Uh, so let me just see. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, what I do is, if you can have a look, uh, if you can have a look uh, on um, the uh, portfolio and have a look, it is on Moodle, uh, and I and I've recorded it as well, Suresh. So please have a look at that. Um, I'm glad you all are enjoying it anyway. It uh, it's it's fun making or rather constructing these lectures because I sort of have a good idea of how much you all know. And I know some of you are quite advanced, but I also know a lot of you are still in your sort of, um, you know, developmental curve. So I don't want to push the boat and put things out there that are too advanced. I just want to make sure you've got the basics and how to recognize basic problems and how to solve basic problems as well. Uh, eventually, as we all get more experience, the level will go up higher and higher. Um, so, okay, guys, uh, if you can all log off, uh, except Jen, and then uh, Jen, I'll have a little chat with you. Jen, uh, when you get a, ch a chance, have a look on your um, on your system, and if you can turn on your audio. Good night, all. Well, thanks, George, for coming. Good night, Alistair. Um, I don't know. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, Jen, I can hear you. Uh, just Hi, Manesh. Hi, Jen. Jen, just one second. I just need to... Um, Alistair, can you hear me? I think Alistair's got the wrong time. Alistair, did you see <laughs> the lecture? <laughs> Wait for Alistair to see. Alistair Nash, can you hear me? Right, Jen, can you hear me? Hi, Manesh, yes, I can, yeah. Lovely. Um, okay, well, uh, first of all, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Uh, this is your first one where you've joined us. So, or is it the first one or have you joined us before? No, this is my first one. Um, I kind of, well, I kind of didn't realise they were going on. I was a bit lax, but um, I missed one or two because I was away. Um, so hopefully we'll be logging on to the rest of them. Yeah, they're, they're all they're all recorded and they're in uh, on the Moodle site. So uh, and the PowerPoints are on there as well. So do make sure you try and join in, Jen, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is I get I get quizzed a lot by the university on participation. Um, yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, um, they're very useful. It's a great little chat and discussion, seeing those interesting little um, kind of you know difficulty cases like so. Um, yeah, huge, a huge benefit to me for sure. Good, good. Jen, how are you getting on with your cases now? Yeah, I'm, I'm going okay now actually. I'm about to complete a couple of cases uh, uh, under Julian Perry's supervision, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I should, should be uploading those in the next kind of couple of weeks. Oh, good. Um, I've identified, I think, my complicated case um, and I'm at the kind of consultation phase with him. Um, uh, kind of an upper, I think it's an upper right one, failed or CT in post, which need, will need bone grafting, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and I've got a couple of other cases, um, so that'll be about five or six cases. I'm still searching for a couple of cases, if I'm honest, but it, I'm more organized now. I've freed up some time, especially for the implant cases. And now that myself and Julian are on the same page, things are progressing a bit more easily than they were to begin with, you know? Brilliant. Jen, what, we, what they tend to, just to let you know how the system works at the university. So every two to three months, they have a progress meeting. 
Okay. Okay. And your name then comes up on this program. <laughs> As uh, in, not, they don't even know if I'm still alive. <laughs> not only your name, but about 40 other names. But I have to then tell them why you haven't put anything on the Moodle site. Oh, okay. They will say, well, you know, you've got her, you've got this, you've got that. What's her, why this person is. Not. So what you want to do is. Yeah. Is. Put something on, just put the photographs on or just fill something on, just start putting something on to show the university that you are engaging. Because what often happens is the students don't put anything on till right to the end. And when the progress meeting happens, I when some of the pros will say, well, no, you have to issue a warning letter and all of the rest of it, you see. Uh, yeah. So I want, what I'd like you to do is on the cases that you've got, at least start putting the initial preoperative photographs or preoperative x-rays because yeah. that that can be brought up and say, oh, yes, this student's obviously started this case, it's underway, they're planning it. And that looks much, much better than me saying, oh, I'll ring her and talk to her and then I have to get a testimonial and that sort of thing. So that would be really helpful if you could do that. Manish, there should be no problem whatsoever. I'll get that sorted in the next... Um... Well, in the next week or so, I should be able to make some yeah, time to do that, no for sure. Problem. I mean, I think the next one is coming up uh, till after December. So put as many as you – and start the cases. So even if you – once you start the case, it shows that you're loading things on because the administrator will say, well, this student has loaded their first four or five cases and they're progressing. And that sounds okay. much better. Uh, uh, but they've got the right to take away – if you're not progressing, that's the thing. And and I know. Okay, well, yeah. I'll get some info on for. I'll, I'll get as much info as I can on before Christmas. Yeah. So um, they've got something. For, you've got something for them. And um, well, I'm hoping that I can even get maybe one of the cases completed before Christmas, as in on the Moodle. So yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. No problem. And keep going, Jen. I know you've done done it the hard way, but uh, you know, make sure you keep your motivation up. And I hope is has, is things working out with Julian. He's very helpful in fairness. Um, you know, obviously he's super busy, so sometimes there's a bit of a time lapse in between, say, consultation phase and him approving it to go ahead. Yeah. Um, but I think I kind of know how he's working now. He's, he's, he's very pleased, really, with all the documentation that I get from Warwick. Good. And it ties in very closely with what he's provided for the Oasis dentists yeah. anyway. So yeah. once I was following that step by step, he was really pleased, you know. And I've seen everything and the process that he follows uh, when we did his site visit, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm very happy with the way things are. I don't think you'll have any problems. If you need any help loading or writing it up, and you don't understand, Colin is the your the person that you want to talk to, and he'll guide you through it on at any time. Yes, no, I've I've met, I had a little chat with Colin or an email with Colin yeah. there during the week, and he he helped me with that little outstanding bit of information i i had an, an, a little problem initially getting onto the pages because i was being locked out um even after i'd re-registered so that slowed me up a little bit at that point but there's no excuse now i can get stuff up for you it's not a problem great jen okay um still live your normal life won't you i'll try <laughs> thank you so much for this evening i'll talk to you again soon <laughs> okay take care jen bye-bye cheers bye bye